welcome everybody to our afternoon discussion on um, nutrition and POTS. Um, my name is Helen Eftahari and I'm an arrhythmia and syncope nurse at University Hospitals Coventry and Warwick. Um, we've also got Vicky with us and Vicky is one of the trusts at, trustees at POTS UK um, and we're more than happy to um, uh, take any questions and queries as we go along. Um, I think the first thing to say about nutrition and POTS is everybody with POTS is, is very different in um, the, the, um, how severely affected they are um, with um, um, gastric problems. Um, so many of the messages here are based on um, some general principles. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the research that's been done around nutrition and POTS. Um, and any questions or queries that you've got, please do ask. And I have to say, with all the evidence in POTS, um, we have, um, they're, they're on a very small um, scale, the studies. They're not on big, there aren't big studies, um, but they do kind of point us into the right way of what we can um, recommend to patients. In addition, many of the um, things we'll discuss about is what our general good principles that most POTS um, clinicians um, will recommend to patients. Okay, so the first thing I think you, we need to talk about is the balance of good nutrition and the balance of good health. And I know for many of you it'll be quite difficult um, to actually maintain some of these principles, um, but also there are people that we do see in clinic that um, aren't as um, tight with what they eat um, and how they eat as they potentially could be. So if you look at the British Nutrition Foundation, um, there, are, there are eight recommended top tips for good health. Um, the first one is to base meals on starchy car carbohydrates. The second point is to at least eat five portions of fruit and veg a day and to eat two portions of fish um, across the week um, and one portion of fish should ideally be oily, cut down on saturated fats and sugars, um, eat less salt, we'll come to all of this in a minute, um, less than six grams a day, um, keep hydrated between six to eight glasses of fluid a day and not to skip breakfast. So some of these will apply and are important points, but also, um, can you all hear me? Somebody can't hear us? Everybody's... The audio is, is fine on our end, Helen. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, so, of course, people for POTS will have a lot of issues with a number of these principles. Thank you, everybody. Um, the first one is um, around um, carbohydrates um, they're, they're, um, and the specific recommendations that we have um, regarding fluids and salt. So the issues for people with POTS there's one around um, having really good hydration. Um, the second one is uh, having a high salt intake. I will explore all of these um, principles um, little by little as we go through. The second one is having gastrointestinal disturbances. We know a lot of people out there will have some very mild gastric symptoms and some people will have very severe gastric symptoms. Dysphagia, and that's a difficulty in swallowing gluten intolerance. Um, we'll touch a bit on low histamine diets and then some top tips for people with POTS and any questions um, that people may have. Good hydration is the key um, to many of the things that we do when we manage people with POTS. Um, we, although when you read some of the literature, um, it will talk about around two liters of fluid a day, in our clinical practice, we generally recommend taking, if you can manage it, up to about three litres of fluid daily. Um, and a good guide, because people sometimes worry about, you know, exactly how much is too much, is that the urine runs clear. And the reasons why we recommend this is that because studies have shown that um, water drinking improves the ability to stand, there's less fainting, and it improves brain fog. Um, there have been studies where they've taken blood samples and looked at blood volume, um, in POTS and compare that to the normal healthy population and have found that there's a 13% reduction in blood volume in people with POTS um, and hence why we do recommend fluids. POTS, intoler um, 
and many people with POTS, you have an intolerance to standing. Um, and for most people, that's due to blood pooling. Um, so we have um, receptors in our legs that gives feedback loops to the heart um, that tells the heart to increase rates to um, force more, more blood to go through the system. And these receptors um, often loosen and slack, um, resulting in a drop in the blood pressure and the blood fluid volume um, actually going into the leg. So not only are people struggling with a lower blood fluid volume, but on top of that, these receptors in the legs, and um, we call it neuropathic POTS, um, which many, many people have, um, uh, result in the blood basically pooling um, in the extremities. Um, studies um, have shown that with just half a litre of fluids, that's a pint to anybody who's older, or half a litre if you're younger, um, and also studies with um, soup have shown that um, if you have this about five, um, after about five minutes, um, improved symptoms, um, people that have been tilt tested, some people have done these studies where they've tilted people, um, one with um, just as they are, and then retilted them after consuming about half a litre of fluid. And they found that their blood pressure and heart rate um, have both improved. So blood pressure has been maintained or increased. And then there's been a reduction in heart rate. And in some of the studies, when the average heart rate on tilting was about 123 beats per minute, it was reduced just with that half a litre of fluid down to 108 beats a minute. Um, to drink more in the morning, and we call this front loading, we'll often advise people that before getting out of bed in the morning, they should have a glass of um, water by the side of their, by the side of their bed, um, at a sit up in bed. If there are medications, they can take their medications at the same time. Um, and to basically kickstart the system. Most of us, just before we go to bed at night, don't drink any fluids because we don't want to get up to go to the toilet. And by morning, our bodies are quite naturally dry, um, and particularly for people with POTS, front loading and kickstarting that fluid works. Within about an hour of getting up, ideally you should be aiming for another half a litre of fluid and that, although it sounds like a lot, so that you get in within an hour of waking about a litre of fluid if possible, then you're looking at um, different ways you can do this. That might be from the water, it might be having a glass of juice, um, or potentially a cup of tea or a cereal based breakfast. And those small things can all help to increase um, the, um, the fluid um, internally. This will also help in terms of many people find the symptoms are particularly worse in the mornings and often this is because they're slightly more dehydrated so having lots of fluids on board will help with some of these symptoms. Um, often people will say take three litres of water up to a day um, but what we really mean is that people should have um, different types of fluids um, the tendency with water is that as much as we take it in it tends to run through us quite quickly and types of fluids that we can we should consider are ones that um, save um, osmotic um, that have the same osmotic pressure as the body fluids, um, and they can provide more energy. Um, so that might be you might have a look at some of the sports variety drinks. Some people really like those. Some people it doesn't suit at all. Depends on on the sugar intakes um, in them, um, but also drinks like milk orange juice, apple juice, those types of fluids. If you think of them, they're a little bit thicker. Their consistency is more in keeping with blood. Um, and a really good question from Daisy around saline therapy here um, to help with the high level of fluids. Um, so Daisy says, have I heard about, I've heard about saline therapy to help people consume the high level of fluid. I've heard that not many places offer this in the UK. What do you think about using this to aid with good hydration? Personally, I struggle to consume this amount of water on my own. Um, and I think that's a really important point. And I'm really glad that you raised that, Daisy, because I think many people um, have that question in the background, particularly if you go on the websites, the American-based websites. Um, there are, um, from what I've heard from my patients, is people often have pictures of somebody who's got a portal um, to have their saline therapy. Um, I actually um, did a whole project, research project, um, which looked at the studies around IV saline therapy. And I would say generally all the clinicians that we work with and organisations, we wouldn't wholeheartedly recommend that people have saline therapy and that there are specific circumstances which we may recommend this. 
the reasons for it is that anything that we do in medicine has to have a really good basis for it and we always have to risk we always have to balance up the risk versus the benefits of any type of therapy the saline therapy in the studies when they did it they didn't look really closely at evaluating it very well so often they just asked people do you feel better with it they didn't look at some other parameters like looking at um, heart rate the changes in the heart rate and also assess whether those people were drinking in adequate amounts of fluids they didn't look at the population to see if they were people with pots that do manage lots of fluids or people with POTS are a lot more symptomatic with things like gastroparesis. Um, I, um, the risks of the therapy, there, there are quite a number of risks. So the, little, the lines that they often use for saline therapy um, go into the heart. They go into the upper right-hand chamber of the heart. Um, when you put those lines in, then you are at risk of infection. And when those lines are present, those infections can, in very severe cases, track into the heart, which is a very serious condition. Um, and we, um, uh, we would generally not use it and recommend it as a therapy. Um, the risk in some of the pediatric studies they looked at, about 14% of people had some quite serious infections um, with saline therapy. I have heard of incidental cases of people that have had subcutaneous saline therapy, there isn't anybody in particular that's doing that, as to the best of my knowledge. Um, there, um, and there are some um, individual practitioners um, that might do that, um, but we wouldn't really, um, we, we really wouldn't recommend it. I think um, the risks um, of it are quite great. The specific circumstances around saline therapy where you might consider it, or you should consider it, is if you're undergoing any type of surgery, um, because people with POTS are generally the younger population, so we know that the majority of people with POTS um, that we see in adult services run from about 17 to 35 years of age. Um, most of those people, if you're undergoing surgery, because you don't have comorbid conditions and the lack of understanding around POTS and the importance of hydration, um, they would say that um, you, you, they wouldn't give you saline, for example. So before the surgery, they'll ask you to have um, no or very little amounts of fluids. Then you have an operation after a general anaesthetic, your blood pressure runs low anyway, which is a bit of a compounding factor for people with POTS. Um, and normally in, that, in a young age group, you wouldn't give IV saline, you would just ask people to drink lots. Um, lots of people with POTS, if they have surgery, will often say things like, I was just collapsing, you know, um, they were trying to get me out of bed and I just couldn't move. So we do recommend, and I do put in letters for patients, um, that if they are undergoing surgery, there should be a very low head threshold for giving them intravenous saline. There are also, and people with EDS, and particularly people that are um, maybe um, um, heading towards, um, have gastroparesis um, and heading towards um, feeding then they might they might potentially warrant saline if for example um they've got a, a severe diarrhea and, and vomiting um, um and bug. so i hope that's if there's any questions around i think that's a really important topic so if there's anyone else out there please just um let us know your queries um so coming back to the other types of um um things to consider when, when it comes to fluids um, the first one is, to, is around alcohol, and I'm sure many of you probably are aware of this anyway, that alcohol um, um, it tends to cause fainting in healthy people. So we've often heard about people that have gone out on a jaunt um, and fainted that night when they got in, or the next day they've tried to get up, aren't well hydrated and have passed out. And what alcohol tends to do is it, is it blunts the normal muscle um, and blood vessel response to standing and drops blood pressure. Um, and that's in a normal, healthy person. Um, alcohol is also a very strong diuretic. Any of you that have, have had a bit to drink, you'll know that you might end up um, just going to the toilet um, non-stop. Um, so alcohol can be a very exacerbating um, fluid. We would recommend if you do have a drink, so in some, there's some younger people and then they might potentially have some alcohol um, or want to go out for a drink with friends is to make certain one that people are sitting that you're sitting down um, because then if you are potentially um, going to um, have any episodes then then we know you're safe to avoid injuring yourself 
Um, you should also um, really try to dilute down and have extra fluids um, on top of the alcohol. Um, caffeine, there is no clear evidence around caffeine. Um, so um, many people um, would say avoid it. Um, I know one or two people that said in a limited amount, caffeine is beneficial um, and helps. Um, you should avoid in hyperadrenergic parts. So the different types of parts of hyperadrenergic one is where you've got, when you're standing up, you have much higher levels of adrenaline in the research study. Some of the adrenaline is off the walls when, when standing up um, and um, a natural stimulant. Um, so because of the natural stimulant being high in the body, then also having something like um, extra levels of caffeine is probably going to send you even a little bit more um, hyperadrenergic. Energy drinks and soda drinks should be completely avoided because they've got empty calories um, and have a lot of chemicals in them. And as we'll come into some of the dietary recommendations, really, um, it's about looking after generally all of your health. Um, energy drinks um, have lots of caffeine in them and they are known to be um, stimulants that contain some of them, like guana, um, twice as much caffeine um, as in coffee beans, so very high stimulants. When you look through the literature, there's actually a case of, of um, Red Bull and somebody who consumed vast amounts of Red Bull um, subsequently got diagnosed with POTS and completely cut Red Bull out um, and, their, and their POTS went away. And that's obviously quite an um, um, isolated case. Increased salt is very important. We do have, and I know somebody had um, emailed Joe and asked around, uh, the first thing to say around salt is you should check with your doctor or one of the clinicians that's looking after you. Um, so one of, sorry, one of the questions to go back was from um, Louise, um, by energy and soda drinks, do you mean any carbonated soft drink or just carbonated energy drink? usually any carbonated soft drink. And um, we've had people come in the clinic and they've said, I'll drink two liters of Coke or two liters of lemonade. And usually those um, don't have um, a, as much benefit um, and lots of chemicals and sugar in them as well. Um, so I would, um, I usually advise all our patients to um, cut it out. And some people, you know, do really like the odd drink or two, Coke or whatever, I would, um, I'd say that's fine, um, but just to make certain there are not, not vast amounts being consumed. Um, right, coming back to salt, um, we recommend, um, and recommendations are between ten, 5 to 10 grams of salt a day, and 5 to 10 grams is a lot of salt. Um, you're looking at every 5 grams is around about 1 teaspoon, not tablespoon, teaspoon of salt. Um, per day and the recommendations the national recommendations always talk about having low salt diets um, if you go shopping anywhere and you have a look at the food labels you quite clearly see that um, salt um, is one of the um, uh, traffic light um, system um, and um, salt, if you know, if it's high, if it's red, then we, then people are advised to keep away from salt. Um, the people that should stay away from salt, absolutely, are people with high blood pressure, people with heart disease or kidney disease also need to avoid salt. If you think of the average POTS person, most people, I would say 95% of the people um, that I would probably see in clinic don't fit into any of those categories. Um, and there are some very good reasons why we recommend salt. Um, the general health message when you're looking at the general population talks about, um, um, is referring to high blood pressure. So generally people, as we get into our middle ages, um, suffer from high blood pressure. It's a huge health problem in the middle to older age groups. Um, and causes a lot of disease um, later on in life. Most people with POTS, however, don't have this problem. Hyperadrenergic POTS is slightly different um, and won't benefit probably from salt increase. However, the um, people who have um, um, the other types of POTS should, would generally benefit from high amounts of salt. Um, 
salt um, works in a number of ways. So um, it's estimated when you talk about migraines, and um, there's a large proportion of people with POTS who experience migraines and suffer from migraines. And a high salt diet um, has been associated with reduced migraines. We had a young gentleman who came into our clinic um, about six to eight months ago, um, and I remember very clearly that he that he said he was he usually is a very severe migraine sufferer. However, and um, once he feels a migraine going on, he has a complete salt splurge, and when he and then his migraine, either if it does come on, it's a lot more reduced or he, he completely averts an episode. Um, salt um, also helps the body retain fluids. So if we talked about the reduction in blood volume in people with POTS, it's quite easy to um, think about the salt um, helping us retain fluids and improving the blood volume. And it also helps to tighten the blood vessels. Most people with POTS, um, if they're with their blood pressures running on the low side, you know, you're probably running, I would say in clinic, I'd be lucky if someone with POTS had a top blood pressure number, a systolic as we call it, running higher than 120. Um, and usually you're starting to look at hypertension, which is the increase um, in, in, blood, in, in blood pressure um, at around about 135, 140 on a regular basis, not on, off, on a one-off basis. Um, so actually one of the questions coming through from Tia is, if you take Evabradine, can you eat salt anyway? Absolutely. Evabradine um, actually doesn't work on blood pressure. So I can, I can briefly talk about the two tablets that do, but briefly Evabradine um, is a highly specialized cardiac drug. It works on something called an IF channel. Um, and the IF channel, there's only two places in the body that have these specialized cells. And one of them is in the heart's natural pacemaker called the sinus node. The other place is actually at the back of the eyes. That's why sometimes people with the Vabradine um, get um, um, feel quite sensitive to bright, brighter lights. Um, the, so Vabradine is purely there for reduction of heart rate. And it doesn't have any impact on fluid volume or on your ability to retain that fluid. Um, the two drugs that do are midodrine and fludrocortisone. Um, and, and midodrine is it's very important to have a very good fluid intake with midodrine. Um, would you recommend taking, so would you recommend taking salt tablets daily to increase as an alternative? Um, and uh, we get asked that question quite a bit. And sometimes we do prescribe it, some salt tablets. Um, from clinics, 600 milligram um, tablets. Um, the reason um, we do that is sometimes people um, have a lot of difficulty in, um, in actually retaining the salt um, or, or being able to consume that amount of salt. Um, some people just don't get on with it um, and they'll, 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 they'll tell us that when they come to clinic. Um, so salt tab tablets are a reasonable alternative. Um, and we can, I've, I've heard of people, um, I can't imagine it myself, but I've heard of people taking um, sort of teaspoons of salt, mixing with things like orange juice as a kind of a bit of a shot. Um, so if any brave souls are out there, let us know how you get on. Um, a couple of others, so we've talked about salt. The question about weight loss, I'll come to a little bit later. Um, Um, okay, so the weight will come. Gary's question about weight loss will come to um, in, in, towards the end of the presentation. And Daisy, you wanted to know what midodrine and fludrocortisone affects. So midodrine tends to tighten the blood vessels um, and increase blood pressure. You can get by increasing the blood pressure that then impacts on the heart rate and reduces heart rate because you get receptors in the heart that. Um, bring heart rates down when it um, senses better fluid volume. The, um, uh, and the guidelines on midodrine, you, and we will often tell people that without the, the fluids on board, midodrine won't work so well. Fludrocortisone works slightly differently in that it expands the blood volume, so it'll make the blood a little bit thicker. Um, NHS, there are some salt ta tablets available on the NHS. Um, I think the issue you'll get is individual prescribers variations, which are across the board in young 
um, in young people um, with POTS um, uh, and whether the GPs would be happy to prescribe pot, um, salt tablets or not. Um, and I have heard of people that buy um, salt over the internet, things like that. I think as long as you're paying special attention to the volume that you're taking in between five to 10 grams and the types of salts as well, because we're, we're talking about sodium based salt um, not, for instance, some of the potassium-based salts. Ah, um, oh, Ria, how did you get... Ria is the one who had salt and orange juice, and she has a very grumpy face there, so I don't think Ria liked it very much. So it'd be interesting to hear anybody else's experiences. Um, and I think the most important thing about all of this, as I said at the beginning, is the principles of this. Some of you will like the suggestions, and some of you will try them, and um, uh, you won't get on well with them at all. Um, some of the tips around um, salt are to have a salt shaker at meal times. Some people, particularly, you know, if you're at home and there are people in the house with high blood pressure, you'll often find those people won't, um, and particularly if they're cooking, won't um, add any salt um, to any of the cooking. And then, of course, we're advising you to take salt. Um, so we often say to people, have your own salt shaker and get an acquired taste for salt. Salt is one of those things. When you first start adding extra salt, things can taste really salty. And if you add a lot, it tastes really unpleasant. However, we can get an acquired taste for salt and it usually takes a number of months, a so bit by bit nudging it up. And the reason it's important is because it not only expands blood volume, it can lower adrenaline um, and it help to improve symptoms as well. Again, in some of the research studies, what they did was they had people with POTS on a tilt table test. They did the tilt table without, um, have, with the patient having been on a low sodium diet. And then um, they um, added lots of salt, um, retilted them, and they found that their standing heart rate had been reduced again by about nine to 13 beats per minute. So you think just by, if you can manage it, just by really tightening up on fluids and salt, you can help impact on the way the, um, uh, on the heart rate response to standing. Um, there are a list on the presentation of a number of foods that you can trial that are high in salt. Salt is a preservative. You tend to find it in canned soups. So a lot of the over-the-counter canned soups you might buy um, in stock cubes. Salted nuts, we often recommend salted nuts very high in salt and are more nutritious than things like pa packets of crisps. Um, and also smoked, cured, um, and canned beans with salt. Um, get used to looking at the labels on charts um, and um, when, you're, when you're shopping um, and looking for the high salt things. Um, right, so one of the questions from Zara is, if exercising, would you need to increase salt take further or preload with salt tablets? Um, very interesting point, Zara. I'm not really sure. Um, I would think that generally you should probably have some extra salt on board. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily you need to specifically preload with salt. Um, to lose a lot of salt in exercise, you need to be going to a really high level. Um, a lot of the people that we would see, I can't imagine, are, are going to um, the high intensity um, that might Mean that you use a lot of salt, but you will lose some salt through exercise. That's a very good point. Um, any more questions around salt before we move on? Okay. So, um, some other basic principles when eating. One is around little and often and having small meals with a low carbohydrate intake. Um, in digestion, normally, we have something called the splachnic bed. And the splachnic bed is all of the um, inside of the gastric tract. And when we eat food, you can get up to about 300 mils of fluid redistributing into the gastric tract in order to digest food. That's why you often see people who um, might need to rest for half an hour, have a little doze after lunch. Um, at Christmas, we run a syncope clinic as well. And we often get lots of people who at Christmas 
they haven't eaten much in the morning because they're looking forward to their Christmas dinner. They may have had um, a glass of wine or a bit of alcohol around uh, later on in the morning, waiting for Christmas dinner, eat late, eat a lot, and then they end up passing out or fainting because they do what we, we call it postprandial or after food fainting. There's a very specific name. It's quite well recognized. Um, one of the ways and one of the things you can trial is um, taking extra fluid before you eat as well. In one study, um, they gave people, um, again, half a litre of fluid, about 405 to 500 mils of water before a meal, and it reduced postprandial syncope. Um, I remember very clearly we had a young girl who kept fainting um, and her mother came to us and said, it's ridiculous, she just keeps putting her head in the food. Um, and, you know, we scratched her head, heads a bit and I just said, why don't you take, you know, just try this, see if it works. And she came back and said it was, it really did help a lot. Um, the reason we say small meals and, you know, having five small meals across the day can really help um, and low carbohydrates, carbohydrates, particularly refined carbohydrates. So that's things like white breads, white pasta, rice, um, potatoes. Um, you've got a lovely, you've got a picture at the bottom there that show, um, you know, what, what the carbohydrate food groups are like. Um, those, and those, the low carbohydrates, um, when you have carbohydrates, you tend to get a, more of a rush of fluid into the, um, into the gut in order to digest those carbohydrates. Um, so for those reasons, low carbohydrates, small meals, and often um, I'll come and answer some of the questions at the, at the end of the slide, if that's okay. Um, also, one of the issues that affects many people with gastric disturbances in POTS is that you get delayed gastric emptying. So sometimes the food runs quite sluggish through the gut. Um, and because of that, um, that will have quite a significant impact on um, the, um, the, uh, the orthostatic or the the um, symptoms and um, when standing up. Um, yeah. The other thing is that people with gastric issues and difficulty in swallowing words, so those are the people with the dysphagia, um, can consider things like a very soft diet. So that's might be mashing up food, um, taking very small amounts, sitting up particularly when having food so that things um, digest a little bit easier. Um, and some people, you know, with negotiation with your local medical team and GP um, around having these fortified drinks. So fortified drinks are things like um, 40 sips, 40 juices. These can also help. Um, I've got a couple of questions coming in. Um, so Catherine has asked us, how would I know if I have hyperadrenergic pots and therefore salt not helpful? In hyperadrenergic POTS, what normally happens is you get a significant rise in the blood pressure on standing. So most of the time in neuropathic POTS, you get a drop in blood pressure um, on standing and an increase in heart rate, or you might just maintain your blood pressure and not have that drop too much. Hyperadrenergic, you get a really exaggerated blood pressure response. Um, people, um, most clinical experts um, will look for hyperadrenergic parts. Myself, I think one of the best ways is if you can get a 24-hour blood pressure monitor. Um, there is something that we do see in clinical practice called, um, it's traditionally called white coat syndrome. Um, and that's often, um, the, and there are people that have very well documented um, rises in blood pressure to do with um, often hospital parking coming into a clinic, seeing a clinician. Um, so sometimes one-off blood pressure readings aren't helpful. And also I think personally having, um, uh, we've done some focus groups with some of our, our people with POTS. And many of them will say that even on a tilt table, Seth, they, they found it so distressing, uh, which makes you wonder if, it, if, if they found the tilt table that distressing, how much of an impact has that had on blood pressure? So I think if you can get a 24-hour blood pressure monitor, 
um, that will help see what your overall blood pressure control is. Um, and really you shouldn't be, you know, if you're starting to hit lots of blood pressure, lots of blood pressure readings over like the 140 mark and the top number and in the bottom number over 90, then you shouldn't be having it. If you're somebody that young, generally there are very few people we see that are young that have any issue with blood pressure and you'll be okay with a high salt diet. Um, there was a clinician who's very famous in the syncope circuit who said that they had um, um, one of the problems that we have um, at the minute is that um, the high salt and um, having a low salt diet has really gotten through and actually a lot of people could benefit from having um, um, salt um, within their um, um, within their diet. Um, Amanda, so Amanda says, um, I always feel my stomach doesn't seem to adjust my food um, um, when I get a headache or migraine. Is this normal? Um, I would say first of all, make certain that you just get, discuss anything with migraines or headaches um, with one of your local clinicians. Um, you should always have that properly assessed. Um, and I would say I, I would say there are relationships um, between diet, headaches, and migraines, um, because we all need um, we all need good nutrition in order for our bodies to function normally. And there are lots of things that can set headaches off. Um, we often find um, people um, you see students, particularly at exam times, um, who haven't been looking after themselves um, to um, haven't looked after themselves properly and they have um and they've ended up having a fainting episodes um just because they're not eating um properly and um or episodes of migraines um i've got one more question let me just have a quick read of it okay wow quite a few questions coming in you give me a minute to read them um daisy I'll, I'll comment on your on your query a bit later on um emma um i seem to always feel better when i eat red meat but what don't want to keep having to eat lots of it is there any evidence we'll talk a bit about um red meat um, um as we come into some of the dietary um, recommendations um so Catherine's asked, uh, it's a good question. Um, are there any recommendations on the maximum grams I have to eat with, eat with each meal? Too little makes me weak. Um, so it seems a lot of trial and error. And Catherine, I think, you know, if you kind of hit it on the nail, really, it is a lot of trial and error. Um, some of the recommendations, like I said, um, will, will, will not be beneficial for, for people, but... I think if there's one message I can get across is, is, is eating counts. It's a very important part and nutrition is a very important part of management um, and self-management really of this, of, um, um, of POTS um, and, and you'll have to trial and error what suits you, what gives you energy, um, what triggers your symptoms. Food diaries are really helpful for anybody out there who isn't sure keep a food diary of what you've eaten, when you've eaten it, how much you've eaten, and then see if something triggers your symptoms off, whether it's a large meal or a certain type of food. Um, okay, so let's move on to um, gluten-free diets. Is anybody out there on gluten-free diets? Um, and yes, for any of you that's joining us late, we'll be um, POTS UK will have this uploaded so you can all um, get, um, you can all look at this again online. Um, right, quite a few on gluten free and celiac. Have many of you tested positive for celiac out of interest? Yep, FODMAP will briefly touch on FODMAP. Very interesting, yeah. 
very interesting. So, um, celiac disease um, is, a, is an immune-mediated small bowel disease, and it affects in the general population. You find people with celiacs in about 1% of the population. What's really interesting is our colleagues in Sheffield, I think Melanie um, spoke um, on the last POPS UK webinar, and their team looked at what was the prevalence or how much, how many people out of 100 people with POTS had celiac disease. And what they found was 4% of those people have celiac. So we know that there's a general trend. We can't say definitely, um, but there's a general trend to having more people with POTS testing positive for celiacs. Um, what's really interesting is in lots of different studies, when they looked at the types of symptoms people with POTS report, they report gastric symptoms, which include things like nausea, bloating, abdominal pain, constipation, and diarrhea. And these all overlap with symptoms of celiac. Um, I think what's really important is um, that um, also within this study, one of the important things they found was that about 40% of the people actually reported gluten sensitivity. So though all they, although they didn't test positive for celiacs, they reported that a lot of their gastric symptoms were helped by a gluten-free diet. Gluten is, you've got a slide there saying what, what contains lots of gluten. Um, Gluten excludes food um, like wheat, barley, rye, oat, um, and related grains. You can find the foods in the supermarket. I think it's probably worth having a, um, a celiac screen, and you can get these as a blood test. Um, if any of you are tempted, and I, I've had a few patients who have trialed themselves on a gluten-free diet and found that they felt absolutely amazing when they did that, um, and then they went to see a gastroenterologist and what they'll actually want you to do to test for celiacs is have you back on a gluten diet for about six weeks. Um, and I've had patients just say, I feel so wonderful. I'm just not going back to the way they were for six weeks um, and therefore refusing to actually have a proper celiacs test. So it is worth getting one if you can. If not, and even if you test negative for celiacs, um, it is worth exploring and going um, and seeing if a gluten-free diet helps um, and yeah somebody there um, talks about a symptom of brain fog we um you know you know in lots of brain fog can be set up by lots of things um, diet is one of them uh, lack of fluids is another one brain fog is very common in people who are dehydrated um, and also um salt um, Right. Yeah, we've got Anne who says that she trialed a gluten-free um, for a period, but it didn't make any difference to her. Um, and I think that's the important thing. You've tried it. Um, for some people, it really works well. And for other people, it, ha it doesn't. Um, so if it hasn't made any difference, then you shouldn't stay on it in the long term. But if it has made a difference, then I, I think... Um, um, then I think it is really important um, to do. Um, anything else on celiacs and glutens? Okay. So our next slide, I think probably it's worth mentioning the FODMAP. So FODMAP, I was trying to look at it before I came, um, came to do the webinar stands for a very complicated long name of fermentable oligo dimonosaccharide and polyols um, and basically um, a low FODMAP diet includes things like vegetables, fresh fruits, lactose free, I haven't got slides on lactose free um, um, diet but I do know people have tried that and certainly um, the American website has some information about lactose um, so it might be worthwhile getting tested and investigating around lactose. Hard cheeses is in a low fat FODMAP diet. There was a question previously somebody had um, around um, eating meat. Um, and meat is part of a low FODMAP diet. So the, the, the next ones are all around um, foods that are high in protein. So the foods that are high in proteins, um, beef, 
pork, chicken, fish, eggs, and um, these these are part of a FODMAP diet, um, and are also very, are sources of, of high amounts of protein, um, and will help um, also um, supplement um, the, the lack of um, some of the carbohydrates. Um, so I encourage you to go online um, and Google. Um, so, so we've got a few other things. Um, We've had somebody else who trialed, very interesting, she trialed a plant-based diet since January. Um, this is um, Leanne. Um, and stopped the diet about three weeks ago. And for the past two weeks, she's been worse and some, some of her worst um, symptoms. Um, and, you know, again, trial and error. So I, I would um, think about perhaps restarting it, um, if, unless there's a good reason why you, you stopped it um, and seen how you get on. Um, and somebody else, Rachel, um, went through the FODMAP with an NHS dietitian. Um, I think sometimes there are so many things that potentially get, can be at play um, with um, diet nutrition. It, it is worth if you can get a dietetics referral. Um, what else? Um, uh, somebody else reports that the FODMAP changed her life. And fantastic. That's Helen. Um, and working with a dietitian to do it properly. And I think that's a very important point is to work with a dietitian because um, a lot of the um, um, you want to make certain that you, you're nutritionally balanced when you're doing this. Um, and Lorraine asks, how long do you need to trial a diet for? I'd probably give it at least a few weeks. Um, and if it doesn't help, then I would probably think about um, trialing something else. Um, Sarah has also said that she's had a lot of good, um, um, uh, she's, she's been much better on the plant-based diets. Um, and Ria's asking, any tips for stop getting lightheaded when eating? Um, I wonder whether taking fluids beforehand might help Ria. Um, I don't think there's anything magical. Um, around that um, and I think probably eating very very slow chewing really really well um, and if necessary trying to make the foods more semi-solid rather than solid um, that's an interesting one from Rosie really good um, suggestions and tips because these have an impact on everybody really um, Okay, yep, just me. Good, good point. Car phrases during eating for Rhea. There you go, Rhea, some exercise while you eat. Advice by Prof Aziz. Yeah, he's very good, um, Prof Aziz. So anybody, any recommendations for him are excellent. Um, okay. Next slide. Um, Next slide is around um, low histamine diet and mast cell activation disorders. Um, again, we haven't got a huge amount of evidence. Um, and when we talk about evidence, we're talking about um, big studies with large numbers of people around um, mast cell activation disorder and POTS. But we know there are a lot of reports. We know that there's the, the, the one or two small studies suggest that there is a relationship with mast cell activation disorder. And certainly in my clinical practice, we would see a lot of people that come in with, um, some people have, quite, have had quite profound allergic reactions. So when we're talking about mast cell activation disorders, we're talking about um, uh, allergic reactions. Some people have had very profound reactions and that will include, um, you know, coming to A&E, um, having um, big reactions um, to food, um, or generally being somebody that's highly sensitive to all types of medications we might trial um, or different pollens, many things. Um, so a low histamine diet will, um, can be of benefit. And again, it's a bit of trial and error. Um, the types of things in a low histamine diet um, are flavonoids, so food that have flavonoids. So there's some pictures there for you. Um, and some tips around the um, histamine rich foods um, to try on. Um, and again, mast cell activation disorders, if you are somebody who's 
um, got even the mild little reactions. So some people might come and they just say, oh, you know, I'm like really blotchy or I've got like these, you know, just get these tiny little rashes and they may not be a full blown anaphylactic reaction in A&E, but actually on a daily basis, they can be quite, um, quite um, difficult to live with. Um, and and um, they have found um, having mast cell activation disorder. So brain fog is a symptom, a symptom that, um, you know, you can do multiple things and try multiple things to try and see if it improves it. Um, and the general rules, and again, these are general rules, around um, low histamine diets are they usually fermented foods or food that's been around for a little while or cured foods like um, bacons and they have preservative and additives um, and sulfites are in them um, and you find them in refrigerated leftovers and alcohol not that we want to really take too much alcohol um, let's see what you've got to say about it um, so Emma, um, she's got a peg feed by the sound of it. Um, and she has a sprinkle of salt to her squash to get her requirements. There you go. Yeah. And uh, if you tolerate it that way, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, and to trial that. And I think perhaps people again getting used to the higher salt intake. Um, so Jill has asked, she's got a 15 year old daughter and she gets a lot of nausea after eating. Um, it might be, again, it might be the types of food. It could be um, also uh, maybe keeping really well hydrated just before eating, that might help. Um, and yeah, I would, I would try some, I would try some of the different types of foods and, and diets that, that we suggested. Um, Rosie didn't tolerate ham very well. Amanda um, and so Amanda sounds to me that she's, she's had some very sensitivities to um, a lot of different types of foods and, and headaches. Um, and I think I think it's worth if you, if you're that sensitive and you get at itches. Um, all types of itches and um, from different foods. You really need to, again, a food diary really helps to see what sets off your symptoms so that you know what to avoid and what helps improve things. Um, and um, it's not a case of it one, one size fits all um, for, for you. Um, and try, trying some of these suggestions um, might really help. One of the things that when we send people to see an immunologist from clinic, one, they often are waiting a really long time to see an immunologist. And second of all, they'll often come back with if they with a really very well detailed letter. Um, but actually, I, I find that on a daily basis, it's not always a helpful letter. It might be um, recommendations around if, if somebody goes into A&E with, with a full blown reaction, what sort of bloods are needed at the time just to see. Um, and just to see if there is any mast cell activation at the background. Um, so I, I think trialing a, lo a low histamine diet, if you think you're, you're somebody who has, has these, um, um, very beneficial. Um, and Miranda, um, she got diagnosed with mast cell activation disorder two years ago after a biopsy. Um, and I think, again, it depends on the immunologist. Some immunologists have a real appreciation um, and, and know what to look for and some um, some also don't. Um, um, Emma's asked, she says she struggles to get two litres of fluid a day and most of this comes from my peg, what can you suggest? Um, the only thing, one of the um, young ladies we had that had a peg feed and um, we've liaised with um, our nutrition team and asked them to, she gets um, extra um, syringes of fluid through the peg feed. Um, and um, so that helps bump it up. And also we liaise with them and ask them to make sure that the types of feed that they're using has a high sodium intake. Um, and she's had some benefits from that. Again, with all of these, 
um, there isn't one thing that's going to cure everything, but it's about managing the symptoms and seeing what you're best with. And all these things, little by little, can make an impact. So the three litres of fluid, have an extra salt, and then paying careful attention to the types of foods and when you eat them, um, and keeping track on what works for you and what doesn't work well for you. Um, the um, eating, we had a question about obesity or increased weight um, and, um, and POTS. Um, and I'm always one to say that we shouldn't be focusing on, focusing on negativity around weight. And being underweight can be just as unhealthy as being overweight. Um, and I think you often find, particularly in young women, uh, uh, a lot of um, issues around um, wanting to be underweight. You know, we've seen all in the press around uh, things around models and you know, looking really completely unhealthy, at least are things like being depression, having depression, anemia, tiredness, low immunity. Um, and so I always think it's very important that you concentrate on being a healthy weight. Um, if, if you are overweight, um, paying careful attention to diet and being positive about the foods you eat rather than negative can significantly, um, I, I think, helps you make those permanent lifestyle changes. Um, the um, you also need to have some some um, some food, and you need energy on board in order to exercise. And as a mood stabler, um, exercise is very important. Um, I, and we recommend that people. Um, take up exercise and do exercise and of course you need energy and muscles in order to exercise um, and having a bit of muscle mass does help because it helps all those receptors in your leg um, so yeah um, there are accounts there was one account in the literature um, of a woman who'd been diagnosed with POTS um, and she was quite overweight she lost weight and it so-called cured her POTS um, and there are studies around people with not people with POTS, but people with um, polycystic ovaries, um, which is a condition that affects young women. And if I can find the reference, um, um, so in people with uh, they did a study of people with polycystic ovary syndrome who were overweight. They looked at 64 people, which is actually quite a high number of people we had. And, and most of the POTS research, you're talking about 20, 30 people in those studies. Um, it had a higher rate of autonomic dysfunction. So autonomic dysfunction is our medical terminology for the abnormal heart rates and blood pressures that you get on standing. And when you meet a certain criteria, then you start hitting diagnosis of POTS um, or another condition we call neurocardiogenic syncope. Um, so people with polycystic ovary syndrome that had were overweight um, had um, a much higher degree of autonomic dysfunction in their, in their heart rate and blood pressure. And also they had much higher rates of plasma adrenaline. Adrenaline is that um, it's kind of the fight and flight hormone that gets released in the body. Um, and people who are overweight had more of that. People with the POTS have higher rates, have higher amounts of adrenaline in studies um, as well so actually if people can manage to lose weight and um, that's always beneficial anything else on weight um somebody's Hello. thanking us thank you so much, Amanda. helen sorry to interrupt i'm just very yeah. mindful of the time at the moment we're coming to the end of the uh the hour slot if you're happy to continue just to finish the slides and then we've got 43 questions in the q a which obviously we won't be able to get through now but we could perhaps um have them emailed into us post them on facebook we could we could maybe get through them in a different way yeah that sounds really good to me um i'll, I'll have to because my my laptop unfortunately i'm at work and uh and the uh battery it plays up from time to time so i've got a, i've got a bit of time left so should we aim for about 15 minutes okay that's no problem at all is that good? And then if there's any specific questions, obviously at POTS UK, they're very helpful. Um, um, clinicians and people like Joe and Vicky work in there. So certainly... Um, it can be um, emailed into us, no problem. Yeah. 
So I'm sorry if I can't get to all of your comments. Thank you for all the positive stuff. Um, and I do know that it's a very hard struggle for many of you. Um, I'll go. I'll run through the slides quickly and then see what answers, we'll see what questions we can take. So, um, coming to the end now, um, prepare tips about preparing meals and cooking tips. Um, so, some of you may still be at home with family um, and be cooking, um, and um, some people will be living on their own, taking active uh, part in cooking. Um, I think that um, making sure you know what's going into your body is really important and the way and preparing it also is very important and putting the time aside you're going to have good days and bad days so on a good day make certain you cook larger amounts and then you can put them in batches and in freezers um, and freeze them because then you it's very easy to pop it in the microwave to, microwave to defrost it um, you can use energy saving devices as well, slow cookers, electric choppers, there's a whole number of them if you can see in, in the slide. Um, planning and pacing yourself is very important. Um, so pacing, you will know better than we do that, um, you know, if, if, if you overdo yourself on one day, the next day you're going to you're going to pay the price, really. Um, so make a certain you plan and pace yourself properly. Um, stick to a routine. Um, and my favourite is get someone else to do the washing up. Um, doesn't happen in my house, but never mind. Um, and sitting down while preparing food. Perch saws are quite helpful. So you've got a slide there with the lady um, that's, that's perching on the perch stool. Um, and very finally, um, oh, deliciously, Ella was a, a bit of a food guru, quite popular a few years back, who did a few... Um, um few, few books and she's got quite a lot on youtube um and um deliciously ella um is says in in her interviews that she was diagnosed with an illness and actually what she was diagnosed with is pots um she was a self-professed even when she was initially diagnosed and for a good period afterwards she's she was a self-professed um haribo queen as she put it. Um, and then she took the decision that she was going to take control of this. And um, there is nothing magic out there that's going to help. Um, and it's a question of, of um, really taking it, things to task. Um, and so um, she claims and she says that um, uh, paying attention to all the simple things counts. Um, and um, she has lots of tips for sort of energy snacks and things like that. So you may find, I've had people who, yep, Emma said, I tried a diet and felt awful. There are people I've had in clinic that have said exactly the same. Um, and um, so uh, again, you, you can try some of these. Some people may find them as some, some of the tips quite helpful. Um, I think the general message, as I've said before, is just try different foods and see if they work. Hopefully take some of these tips Food, di food diary will be excellent because then you can track and you can see what your personal triggers and what personally helps you. Um, make certain that, again, um, fluids, I can't push fluids enough, um, up to 10 grams of salt, small portions and frequently across the day, um, low carbohydrates, foods, um, have a diet high in fruit, veg, nuts and seeds. Um, yeah. So, shall I see if I can take a few questions, a few of these comments or questions in, in about the next five minutes? Vicky, have you got some? Yeah, if you have the time to do a few, then that's that's no problem at all. Along the bottom of the screen is a Q&A section. Okay. If you just click on that, then they should pop up on your screen. Right, let's have a look. Um, I think one talk, one thing I will mention is, oh yes, look at that, 41 questions, right, um, is that there are, we know that it's difficult for most people with POTS um, in different areas. Um, if you do find somebody that's close to you, even some of you when you move to university, university or things like that, um, then, you know, you know, you found out about local pot service, POTS UK has those on board, um, then certainly get um, a GP, register with a GP at something like a university and get referred in um, to one of those local 
clinics and many clinics including ourselves and um, take people from slightly out of area as well right so we've got a question about any dietary recommendations to help manage increased gastric motility um, i think again it's uh, again it'll be be doing a um doing a food diary and keeping track of everything that um, you're taking in and seeing what sets off um, the gut motility. And if some of your gastric symptoms, if they're that bad, make certain that you, you get yourselves referred into a gastroenterologist, all of you, um, because we do recognize quite a bit um, of problems. Um, we've tackled, we've looked at red meats. That was one of the questions. Um, low histamine diets, hopefully you found that, Haley, you found that um, beneficial. Um, we're real, we've talked a bit about your dizziness. Um, Liana. Oh, that's interesting. Yes, Liana um, has talked about um, if, she's, if she has a bad day, she makes a pot. Um, dehydration solution at home and it works wonders. I've had people who have um, taken Dioralite um, and so they keep things like sachets of Dioralite or somebody re once reported something like banana juice that they had um, that was quite expensive but helped enormously. Um, Emma, hopefully I've meant, talked about the feeding tube um, and salt. Um, Chloe's asking if there's any risks with a vegan diet and having parts. There's no risks involved. In fact, if anything, it's probably better when you think about the types of food we've spoken about. Um, um, again, just make certain that you're having your calorie intake, um, which you can get in, in various forms, um, and that you um, are having sufficient amount of proteins um, and a varied diet. Um, Haley, caffeine we talked about, so hopefully that helps. Um, when we drink and serve. Okay, so Jennifer's asked, when we are drinking such a lot, how is it best kept in rather than going in one way and out the other? And again, if you take um, more viscous and thicker fluids, um, that you'll help keep those in. Um, better. There is one small study recently, that, or last year, that came out and they used one of these um, very thickened type um, nutrition drinks. Um, I don't mean to, I don't want you to promote that you go out there and buy nu um, nutrition drinks, or, um, but you know, some of the thicker type milkshake almost type consistencies will help and salt will help it um, retain. Um, Someone's asked about spacing out salt tablets. I'd probably, um, I'd probably rec recommend, yeah, they should be spread out throughout the day. Um, and probably with meals would be the best. Um, I don't know any specific evidence around that. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, so Leanne's asked a question, Liana's asked a question about high blood pressure, which is taking medications for, um, and um, if you're drinking three litres of fluid a day, would that wash away the salt that you consume? Um, I don't think that's, a, I think that's an interesting question. Um, in our clinical experience, um, that doesn't happen. Um, and if anything, it helps you do the opposite, as we discussed, which is retain the fluid. Um, but that's an interesting point. Um, so, um, um, again, anybody, there's a question around POTS experts. Um, so the POTS experts, if you um, check on the, if you contact POTS UK, they'll, they'll have a list of the POTS experts. Um, that are local to you, um, or the closest one. Helen, we actually have um, a list of doctors on our website. There's a, a page on the POTS UK website where um, people can search for specialists in their local area, but also 
Um, I think people generally have to travel out of area because there's not very many in the UK. Um, so a lot of people do have to travel to see them. But um, people can ask to be referred to um, the doctors that are on our website. Sure, absolutely. Um, and we, we, do, we do. We take some people from quite far away and come to see us in clinic. Um, I think I'm going to just ask one, answer one more question and see if you want to add anything else, Vicky, to it before we, we leave. Um, That's no problem. Um, Rachel, one of the questions Rachel has asked um, around um, Hashimoto's and underactive thyroid and POTS. And I think the interesting question there is there's, there's um, the researchers internationally are looking at autoimmune conditions um, that can be responsible for, um, for, for POTS and, and or some varieties and different types of POTS, not all POTS. And, we, and, um, and um, Hashimoto's um, is one of those. Um, and we do sometimes, from time to time, see people with some sort of an autoimmune issue at the background. Um, and then they've also presented with POTS. Um, so, you know, in, in those conditions, um, it's important to have your thyroid properly medicated anyway. Um, and, um, and so it's, it's an interesting point. And it's one of those watch this space. Um, we saw Blair Grubbs speak around um, autoimmune um, treatments and POTS. Um, we don't recommend it because, again, it's around balancing the issues. There's not enough evidence. And in fact, the potential side effects of that treatment is, is, can be absolutely um, um, astronomical. So actually, it's not worth going down that route presently. But it is something that there, there are clinicians internationally um, asking those questions and thinking about. Anyway, Joe, I'll leave it at that. Um, uh, sorry, Vicky, anything else you wanted to add? I don't think so. Uh, I've been keeping an eye on the chat, Helen, and um, this webinar has been really well received. So I just wanted to say thank you from all of us at POTS UK um, for, for doing this for us. I think you've, um, now you've stopped sharing your screen, your microphone has been muted, so you need to unmute your mic now. Thank you everyone for joining us. We apologise for the technical issues that we've had at the beginning of this um, and also right now from sharing the screen but um, this webinar has been recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube channel and um, I will personally make sure that goes up on all our social media as well if anyone wants to watch this back or catch the beginning. I know a few people didn't catch the beginning of it but thanks for watching and we'll see you at our next webinar.